Welcome to OK Computer. I'm Dan Nathan. I am joined by Rick Heitzman. He is the founder and CEO at First Mark Capital. Rick, welcome back to the pod. Hey, it's great being back in the pod. A lot of stuff happening and the world's starting to wake up. Oh, stop. You're going to give me the green shoot sort of thing. I know you're going to do that. Oh, I'm not gonna, I won't use it. Now it's the third rail. I can't use it anymore. No, you can't. But you and I, we got a lot to talk about, about some of the what's going on in the IPO markets with markets making new highs, um, some really interesting valuation stuff in both mm -hmm. public and private markets here. A lot to talk about in AI. I, your partner, Matt Turk, dropped his yeah. MAD report. That's the machine learning AI. The Easter and, MAD report. I know. So that came out. That's his 10th annual. So we're going to have to have Matt come back on the that's pod and awesome. talk to us about that. Um, we'll put that in the show notes. So check it out here. Um, but stick around. After the conversation that Rick and I have right here, Rick and I also talked to Joanna McFarland. She is the CEO of Hop Skip. Drive. This is a company that you invested, what, seed-ish? Like seed. Seed, seed. In the seed. We were the first investors probably seven, eight years ago, and she's done a phenomenal job. We invested when uh, they had no rides, no product, no nothing, just an idea uh, of a phenomenal CEO, very, very uh, mission driven yeah. and had a very personal problem of, hey, how do I how do I survive in a world where there's a lot of different pulls on my time, especially around my children? And she created an amazing product that now is powering over 10, 12,000 rides a day. Yeah, no, it, it's actually a, it's, it's a really interesting story. And like you said, it's mission driven. And, and again, you know, you kicked off the Funders and Founders series with us, um, I want to say, uh, you know, about a month and a half ago. And it's kind of interesting to see just some of these conversations that I've had with these founders and these mm -hmm. uh, investors and how those uh, relationships have evolved over time. And yours is really, really interesting because I know you are still very actively involved as a board member with oh, yeah. this company. And it sounds like they're starting to inflect. So stick around for that conversation there. All right, let's hit it because you were on CBC's Fast Money. I think it was the day that Reddit um, IPO'd. And, yes. and this is one I thought was really interesting. I mentioned on the pod last week, Casey Newton, who writes The Platformer. Yes. He's great. He called it, he called it a uh, lifetime participation award. This is an 18-year-old yes. company that finally went public. It seems like over the last year or so, they've been getting their financials in order. Some of the spending, um, mm -hmm. just, you know, just really some of the metrics that would make sense that you'd want to see for a company that is looking like it's growing that is you know doing things at the right time and that's all kind of came together in the last year and a half. I think two years ago, three years ago, it didn't go public in that period of 2021 yes. because a lot of those metrics weren't really in line. Right. So talk to me about what we've seen in the markets. It's kind of interesting. Went public, big one day pop, Astera Labs, I think was yes. also the same day, day before, or so. Day before. Day before. Had in a, in similar, a different part of the market. Totally different part of the market. And they had huge rips. They both doubled in the days after. It seemed like almost like a quarter end, month end mark, which was kind of weird. And now they've both gotten kind of slammed in the last few trades. Yeah, I think mean, they're still trading up from yep. where they were. Yep. Um, and you've seen more volatility in the broader market. I think there were some some, uh, some positive gains there. But, you know, Reddit's a great story. A great friend of the pod, Alexis Ohanian, yeah, uh, right, was right. founder there, uh, started out of his basically his dorm room at UVA and one of the first crops of, of YC and thought about that and built that community. And he's not only a great friend of the pod, but a great entrepreneur and yeah. friend. Uh, so that company, you know, 18 years later, right? Yeah. Long, long winding road, um, had a bunch of ups and downs. You know, they, there was a lot, you know, there was a lot of questions about hate speech on the, on the platform. Yeah. There was a lot of questions about, is this advertiser safe? So getting away from what that content is, is that advertiser safe? If you're a large media holding company or advertising holding company at WPP or Havas, are you going to put your Citibank ad yeah. next to uncertain content? And does Reddit have the tooling to make sure that doesn't happen? Yeah, moderation was a have, huge issue, right? These so last it's few moderation, years. but it's also, yeah. is, is this ad safe, right? So yeah. all the tools that uh, Meta had to build, all the tools that Pinterest had to build, all the tools that uh, all the social platforms had to build to make sure you're not advertising the wrong things against something. And therefore, without those tools, you're not going to make the same amount per user, right? So the key thing that drives some of the key valuation metric is ARPU, right? Average yeah. revenue per user. And you know Pinterest is kind of best in class in that very safe content. 
search, uh, you know, searchable and therefore high intent mm -hmm. on the things you want to see. Whereas kind of a broad based, hey, I want to talk to you about why the Sixers are going to come back under Joel Embiid win the championship isn't really that. Is Joel coming back this week or no? He's coming back this week. Okay, yeah. good, good, and good. They are, are going to. So win Sixers the Twitter is going to. Sixers Reddit is going to get hot again. Sixers is that Reddit part is of it? going to get super hot. It's going to get super hot. Yeah, obviously there's endemic advertisers there. Our friends at DraftKings, our friends at StubHub, yeah. are, are make sense. But you know, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense on on the long tail. But so not, I would say, not a pristine company, as, as, yeah. as you're saying, and, and nor would it be a company that you'd see having a huge pop. What does that tell us about the markets? It probably tells you there's some pent up demand for IPOs. Yeah. You know, after really being shut down for about three, uh, two, three years, you know, coming out of this time of volatility, high you know, interest rate uh, rises, you know, and for companies, and we've talked about this a lot, both on OK Computer and as well as some of the other programs, you know, companies have had to deal with going from grow at all costs because capital is free to getting profitable and being efficient. And so, you know, companies have done an in-between job. Reddit still is not profitable, mm -hmm. although they've gotten a lot more efficient mm -hmm. and it's growing. So they're focusing on, on all the right metrics. And then there was buy-in. I think there, there was two levels of buy-in. I think one of the things was the, a real litmus test for the public markets in, you know, are people wanting to buy IPOs? And this, you know, not a pristine story. You know, social media, uh, to a certain extent, is a last generation story and therefore, folks wanted to participate. That was that was super interesting. And then there was a little um, little dollop of is this a meme stock, right? Yeah. So are there are there Redditors no different than you know some of the other participants in the market who are who are buying a meme stock as as a vote for as a vote for the company. And I think that pushed it a little bit of the way also. So it's interesting, you know, when you talk about this demand for an IPO, I think a lot of um, market participants have gotten pretty savvy about this is like, if you can get allocations, it's a well-known name. They yes. don't even actually have to be making money. In the case that you just mentioned, I think, you know, Reddit last year had what, 800, 900 million dollars yeah. in revenue and they lost maybe 90 or something, like, over that or something yeah. like that. And they're getting costs in line, that sort of thing. But the user growth is not really like moving that yeah. much or anything like that. And, and I gotta be honest with you, like I'm pretty good with the internet. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like, and I've literally never used Reddit and I never will use Reddit. And so like, so my point is, is like, you know, I, I'm sure there's, a, it just seems very niche to me. And then when I think you sent me this tweet from Dan Primack, and we'll put it in the show notes that, you know, uh, in the last two years, okay, since Fidelity rolled their stake in Twitter, yes. okay, at 54.20, at $44 billion, mm -hmm. Fidelity has written down the value of that investment by 73%. Think about that. That is 30 some billion dollars that have just gone poof. You know what I mean? Yeah. Since them, since Jack Dorsey, since a bunch of other large institutional investors. And it just it just speaks a little bit about- Do you want to say different... the E word? No. Well, I mean, <laughs> Elon, I mean, it just like think about like, all the banks that are on the hook for oh, all yeah. that debt. There was $13 well, billion dollars in debt. So I guess my point is, is like Snap is in the shitter. Yep. Twitter is obviously in the shitter, but it's yep. in the private markets. So, so my only point about Reddit, it was new, it was shiny, and they were giving it to you at a price that you better have been able to clear it at yeah. a certain level. And so it gapped up- 13 bucks, 34 to 47. Yes. And then it went to 75 in the week later. Yep. You know where it is right now, Rick? It's at $46. Yeah. So it's on its way back to its IPO. I'm not price. sure if it's going back, but it's, you know, I, I think a lot of the allocation in the IPO went to hedge funds who were trading on that, right? You know, is this going to be a meme ish stock? Are there participants in the platform who are going to buy it? Is this a retail name that retail is familiar with? And therefore, it's going to gap up over a couple of days. And can you take your profits you know, between now and the end of the quarter? Yeah. And, and so let, let's talk about this a little bit as a VC. OK, so a lot of, you know, companies that are in your portfolios that you advise, you know, mm -hmm. like they've been waiting for the time. They've been waiting for the right market to come back yes. in. The interest rate thing that you mentioned kind of fueled the 2021 sort of thing yeah. that we had. The flip side of that was 2023, where we had, you know, Fed funds going up. It seemed like every mm -hmm. Fed meeting and the like, and so capital wasn't free. The focus on um, profitability was something yeah. that you've been talking about on the pod for years now, actually, like right through 2021. So when I think about it now, what are some of the conversations you're having? Because the NASDAQ's at all-time highs. The Fed seems very confident with the trajectory of the economy, despite yes. the fact that they're not going to be lowering interest rates as fast as, let's say, some market participants would like them to do. But some of the data suggests that, like the party's back on, that the IPOs, if you had an S1, you know, ready to go a couple yeah. years ago, you might want to start dusting it off. But the only question I have for you, and we'll put this list um, in the show notes here, is when you think about some of the biggest companies heading into the 2022 bear market that were 
private, okay? SpaceX was obviously yes. one of them. Stripe was another one. Databricks was another one. Mm -hmm. Epic Games, Fanatics. These are all com Canva, all yes. companies that you know really well, but I don't hear anything about these companies as late 2024 or maybe even early 2025 IPO candidates. You are hearing about them as 2025 candidates okay. and some people, everyone's dusting off their S1s. Yeah. So no one wanted to be the canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to a certain extent, Instacart, um, Clavio and Arm, although that's not a real real kind of growth IPO mm -hmm. that we traditionally consider, were the canaries in the coal mine. They kind of got smoked in September of last year. So everyone's like, well, maybe the market's not on. And now folks are, are starting to wade in the waters. I think you're going to see some consumer IPOs. I think you're going to probably see StubHub. You're probably going to see SeatGeek on the ticketing side. Mm -hmm. Amazingly, two very similar companies mm -hmm. in a similar market that'll go out. You might see Harry's.com mm -hmm. on, on the broad broader consumer internet side. And so you'll start to see those come out, but you know, those are not going to be the $50, $100 billion IPOs. Those are going to be, call it two to 10. Mm -hmm. And you know, you'll be able to, you'll be able to uh, test the market with those. And then assuming things go as planned, right? The economy stays relatively strong. Uh, the market stays relatively strong. Interest rates, you know, not only not stop rising, but they start falling. Mm -hmm. And there's some reasonable transition around the election. I think those top 10 companies, which will do the massive IPOs, are, are getting everything dusted off, getting every, uh, their Sarbanes-Oxley in place, and they'll be ready to go a year from now. And that'll be the it'll be the big kind of pent up IPO pipeline of twenty five. All right. So, and then what are you telling your companies if they say to you, "Hey, listen, Rick, you know Stripe has stayed private for all yeah. these years. They're operating really well. Like, what, like, what's the push and pull about like companies that want to retool? They want to get like whatever this this trend right. Like, there's going to be a lot of companies I'm sure that have kind of reoriented towards yeah. AI, right? And so they want to kind of make that reorientation probably in the private markets. They don't want to have to, have to start telling this story. And I think Reddit's a great example in a way is that, you know, it was also, I think it was a double-edged sword. I think it was from Google where they got a $60 million two-year contract, yes. access to their API, right, for training large language models yeah. and the like. And that's very high margin sort of stuff, but there's not a long tail to it, right? Like, well, well everybody what, wants some of that AI pitch you does. Yeah. I mean, Reddit's going to do, you know, $800 million in revenue mm -hmm. and got $20 million from Google. And they talked more about the yeah. 20 than yeah. they talked about the other 800. Uh, obviously, great. Obviously, shows are participating in, in the AI economy, and uh, and obviously, great margin on that revenue. But maybe maybe a little bit overdone. So everybody's not only reacclimating their business model to show efficiency, so mm -hmm. sh showing up both a path to profitability as well as growth. And we've talked about that before. It's not either or; it's both, especially in the public markets. But in addition to that, how do you get close enough to the to the heat? of AI and hopefully some of that pixie dust will wear will wear off on you. We're seeing that both in, you know, with companies like Astera Labs in the public markets, which ripped after its IPO last week or two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Um Largely being, you know, not a not really a sexy company, not, nothing that's retail investors would use or buy or do whatever it is. But the fact that it had AI ma meant it ripped. And we're also seeing the private markets. Mm -hmm. We're seeing things attached to AI are getting valued at um, a, a completely different, uh, almost 20, 20, 20, 20, 20 or 2021 like yeah. um, valuation environment. Yeah, but it's interesting. The numbers now are so much bigger. Like every day I look up and I'll see a different story, whether it be you know, on um, the information or, you know, The Verge or something like that about some of the valuation levels here. And there's really not a lot of meaningful revenue. I mean, like when you were looking at the open AI, I think they were raising a few months ago and the revenue run rate that they were on, what was AR, like a one and a half billion or yeah. something like that. So you're doing numbers that is growing really fast, but the multiple on the valuation is growing five, 10 X that. And so like, so the headline, you know, that I read this morning was about scale AI at 13 yes. billion. Um, Amazon Amazon coming in for another 2.75 billion in Anthropic. This is a company not, that they're not only using their models, but they ultimately want to compete at some point. They're doing other investments. The same thing with Google is investing in Anthropic, big billion dollar numbers, and they will be also competing with them. So how does this all square from a valuation standpoint where there seems to be a lot of frenemies out there? Yeah, uh, two, two pieces. A, so how do you think about how do you think about how do you value? What are so if you're sitting there in a, an investment partnership saying, "Hey, we're going to throw in another billion dollars at thirteen billion dollars or over a hundred times revenue," 
what, what you're obviously not saying, hey, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna make a bet of that type based on AI being cool. You have to have some logic behind it. Mm -hmm. So as we look at these things, we're we're always saying, hey, would we do that knowing what we know? And if if obviously we come to a conclusion that's different than that, we say, well, what are they thinking? Mm -hmm. What do, these aren't stupid people. These are thoughtful investors who have made a lot of great investments. What are they thinking? So the key thing that a lot of these folks are thinking is with the new AI models and the new, uh, there's going to be a new whole AI powered class of software. Mm -hmm. And you're going to rethink about every single business model, especially software based business models. So you think about the legacy ERP guys and whether that's two generations ago of the IBMs or SAPs or last generations with the HubSpots and Salesforces. Are those models going to be rethought about from an AI first, data first perspective, and the new giants will emerge on this new platform? So you're making that bet where you say, hey, there, there are several, several hundred billion dollar companies to be built, and this is the early days. And now in the, in the Cambrian era of AI, this is the time you make those bets. Or can you say, hey, there's huge profit pools out there that this is going to be able to chip away at. So you look at the profit pool that Google has on search. Can you chip away at a part of that profit pool by using something different? And even if you're only able to get 10% of Google's search profit pool, is that still a multi-billion dollar company? So those are the two different ways that folks are trying to size the market and probability adjust you know, the outcomes there and you know, creating the underwriting models that you're seeing out there in the market. Well, it's interesting. <clears throat> so we had um, Ann Bordatsky who led the Series A in Perplexity. And yep. so that kind of speaks exactly in the CEO of Perplexity, Arvind Srinivas, um, a few weeks ago on the pod. And it was interesting because the way you just framed it, going after, let's say, you know, the search TAM yeah. that 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 you know Google owns and per, a company like Perplexity is clearly doing that. But you know, that A round was a year ago. The B round yes. was late last year. Supposedly there's a C round that's being reported on right mm -hmm. now. And the valuation keeps doubling, right? Yes. Despite the fact that the revenues are probably in the tens of millions. Okay. Yeah. And so you think about that. How do these companies whether it's a perplexity at a billion, a scale at 13 billion, an anthropic at what, 20, or, you know, it's a, yeah. how do they grow into these ricks? Because, you know, we started the conversation by talking about smaller IPOs yeah. testing the waters. Well, you, and, you gotta and, say you're growing slow then fast, right? Yeah. That they're gonna say, you know, Google grew slow on the revenue side, then very fast. Yeah. So you, uh, same thing with Meta, once they turned on monetization. So you have to assume you're gonna build a huge consumer footprint or enterprise footprint and then be able to grow in there. And then you're also going to have um, huge barriers to entry. So are there data network effects that you have proprietary data and can build data network effects around that? You know, Are there large language models that you've built are proprietary to your use case, which are much better than everyone else's? Mm -hmm. And you know, people that are, are bet making these bets, and we, we've made several, is that you know, can you prove that you're, you're going to be a winner? And, you know, now and the conventional wisdom is, you know, in this last next and last year, last couple of years, next couple of years, the winners are going to be decided of this AI revolution. And if you're not in those companies and those companies aren't incredibly well capitalized, they're not going to be able to take advantage of this seismic shift. And therefore, you, you better get in. And you better make sure those companies are adequately capitalized to take on both the competition from other startups as well as the grounded uh, leaders. Do you get nervous, though? And again, you've been through a bunch of these kind of cycles, the hype cycles, but also the ones that really yeah. turned out into being, you know, massive, massive, yeah. like long tail sort of situations where, you know, you read headlines. Here's one from the information this morning. Microsoft and OpenAI plot $100 billion Stargate AI supercomputer. It sounds like they're taking like, you know, a page out of Elon's play book a little yes. bit with all the funny names and the big numbers. And we remember Sam Altman, I think it was about a month or two ago, was talking about how they need to raise trillions of yes. dollars, seven trillion, you know, for all the GPUs. I, and I, I think a little bit of that is an air war of saying, hey, I'm a, Sam Altman, a couple other people are the only people who can raise yeah, billions yeah. and trillions. Yeah. So they're, they're able to say, unless you could raise $10 billion, don't bother showing up. Yeah. So you're getting people out of the game by raising the ante so much that, uh, that a lot of people can't participate who don't have an access to a Microsoft pocketbook or a Middle Eastern pocketbook. Yeah. Well, so in these past cycles, Rick, you guys are early stage. You've come yep. on our shows and you talked about how you were like the first check in and yeah. you know what I mean? You participated, you know, from, you know, C to Series A, B and, and, 
and then you let some of the other guys get into the goofy valuations yes. once, and then you exit. You know what I mean? Like yeah. ultimately, now obviously there's strategic M and A as an exit. There's IPO and the like here. So when I think about where we are, you know, right now, have some of these strategic partners. You know, Nvidia is huge in the VC space, right? Yes. And so we just mentioned, you know, Microsoft, which is mm -hmm. kind of funding. You know, all these massive platform companies are throwing billions and billions of dollars around. Is it crowding out VC? Is it crowding out price discovery that I think you guys are generally pretty good at? You know what I mean? Like, isn't that kind of the drill? And you guys aren't getting kickbacks from the companies that you're investing in buying your cloud services or buying yes. your GPUs and the like. And so is this different this time? Well, I think the in-kind investment is much different. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's much more different. So you think about what OpenAI got from Microsoft mm -hmm. or GCP is doing certain deals, Azure is doing deals. Um, obviously, AWS is doing deals. Yep. So that's a little bit different. And so it's not really hard dollars. And then obviously, NVIDIA has a big fund. OpenAI mm -hmm. has a big fund. So you always are, are, are somewhat wary of corporate VCs mm -hmm. and what how much of their um, valuation is based on their strategic need versus being in the hottest companies versus a real valuation match. You're always worried about corporate VCs, about how much of their value, how much of both the valuation decision and the decision to invest is being involved in a hot company or getting strategic access or buying the poster for their website. So all those things have less to do with making money for their investors and more to do with other, other things. So you worry a little bit about that in this part of the cycle. And you're starting to see things that don't wholly make sense from a deal dynamics perspective, perspective, whether that's pricing, whether it be structure of the investments, or you know a bunch of other insanity that you, you've seen out there that I'll, I'll, I won't uh, I won't repeat to protect the innocent. Yeah, fair enough. Hey, you just mentioned though some of these kind of incumbents in the last cycle. So some of these ERP or these yep. you know CR. When I think about this, there's a really interesting one out here, and this is Adobe. And we know that they tried to buy this company, Figma. And it's a yes. great company, and it probably would have great, been a great partnership and the like. But regulatory, you know, like just shut it down, mm -hmm. right? So they call off that deal. Adobe reported earnings. I want to say a few weeks ago, and they just did didn't have enough to talk about as it related to generative AI. Now, yes. we know that the Figma deal had something to do in and around the edges on like mm -hmm. thinking about just better competing with some yep. upstarts and the like here. But this is a two and a quarter um, billion dollar, or so a $225 billion market cap company that's down 20% from its recent 52 week highs, more from its all time highs from 2021. And public market investors are basically saying right now, you don't have what it takes to be mentioned in this, yes. you know, generative AI public markets story. And I just find that really interesting in a way because we've had new highs in the NASDAQ almost seemingly every day for the last yes. two months. And it's starting to get a little more picky and choosy. And another name, this was a darling in 2021, Snowflake doesn't yes. have the goods. Their CEO just, their legendary CEO yes. just resigned here. So are we starting to see, like, does this, is this potential bifurcation between the haves and the have nots, is it going to make it more difficult to bring some of these companies to market if you don't have the story? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I, you, I, you, I have to, you have to be that. part of, or even if you're one, if you're a software company today, are you disrupting yourself mm -hmm. and are you going to be part of that next generation? You're going to be able to leverage your capital base and your distribution advantage, similar to a Microsoft, to be reinventing yourself, to be part of that next generation, or are you going to be left behind? And I think, you know, Adobe is doing some stuff, especially around mm -hmm. advertising and the Firefly mm -hmm. project, which is helping them reinvent part of their business. Um, Snowflake is partnering with one of our companies, Data IQ. Mm -hmm. We said Florian on the pod. Yeah, we did. And they were, uh, Data IQ was Snowflake's partner of the year to doing some of the generative AI stuff for them and, you know, figuring out a way in their ecosystem to take advantage of the emergence of enterprise artificial intelligence. So people are trying to get into it, but it's very clear when you look at the earnings calls, uh, there's almost a perfect correlation with stock performance and the amount of times that you mention AI. I'm not sure if that's good or bad. But, you know, obviously, this is going to be a time over the next two years where every corporation has going to, has, is going to need an AI strategy. And not only are they need a strat, not only are they need the talking points, but they're going to need to be able to execute. And I think there could be a beginning of consolidation in the back half of this year and next year.
Yeah, well, another one. I mean, we just mentioned Casey uh, Newton at Platformer. He had an article about the indie uh, AI companies, the private yep. ones, some of them having a very difficult right now uh, time, you know, some that are basically, you know, inflection. We just saw yes. that and how it's just kind of engulfed by Microsoft as a bit of an aqua hire. But he listed a bunch of other examples. Just before we get out of here, I want to get your take on this. This was an article in the FT, so we're recording this um, Monday afternoon. You're probably listening to this on Wednesday. What is huge, huge AI funding leads to hype and grifting warns deep minds Dennis Hassabis. British AI pioneer says billions of dollars uh, being poured into startups is obscuring scientific progress in the field. I didn't expect to see that. The surge of money flooding into artificial intelligence has reshuffled in some crypto-like hype that is obscuring the incredible scientific progress in the field, according to Sir Sir Dennis Haspis. So that's interesting to me. And then it goes on to talk about some other things, um, some some similarities to what we saw in crypto yeah. and, and, the, and the like here. But but again, it seems like as many positive stories there are about valuations, about who's partnering strategically, about all the amazing whiz bang things that are yep. coming out of us, there's starting to be some sort of like focus on, okay, how do we commercialize these products? How do we keep moving forward in yeah. the right you know direction and the like well, here? You're, you're making the transition from science projects to business. Yeah. And that's always the key thing. Yeah. And that's where we think it's super important, you know, that we like to invest in companies that have products which do jobs. And those jobs have a real ROI for enterprises or for consumers. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these things, again, on the very primordial era of AI that, that's kind of reemerged over the last year or two have been science projects. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not even science projects, sometimes scientists in, in, in search of a project that are getting mm -hmm. tens or even hundreds of billions of dollars because they're a foremost thinker in the space. So now as these guys are starting to do projects or getting away from the science projects and going after doing the real work, some of the science project guys are mad about that because yeah. they, they 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 believe in research for the sake. Of well, research. that was a bit of the open AI like yeah. dust up in the fall, and you're seeing that play out in in a lot uh, some well, other really well being clear company. now, right? Yeah. Some of the a lot of those folks are being clear, saying, "Hey, yeah. it was great when I was in the Deep Mind Lab, I was in the Meta yeah. Lab doing research for research sake, but now the economic opportunity is so great, I'm going to go start a company, found it." and see if I could participate in the economic stream going forward. And in order to do that, I have to build a product that people are willing to pay for because yeah. it's able to uh, create real value. And that's hopefully the part of the cycle we're at now that a lot of the researchers are saying, hey, this is uh, this is a real thing. We can create real products that are going to create real value for people and therefore very valuable companies. And that's super excited to participate in. You just said something really interesting that a lot of these, you know, former like, you know, academic thinkers who are inside these labs and writing these papers and, and the like here, they jumped ship because they knew they could go raise hundreds of millions of dollars at a billion dollar valuation and then continue to do that as long as they keep kind of moving towards this narrative narrative of LLMs or multimodal and, and and really speak to it. And they know that these hyperscalers are going to be really interested because if it works, then they're going to want to put those products and services on their cloud yes. and then resell them. And so that's like this kind of, you know, this kind of virtuous sort of yeah. cycle in a way. At some point, the music's going to stop, though. There's going to be something yeah. that, that causes a big slowdown. I suspect it's going to be the lack of commercialization of exactly. some of these products in the near term. Exactly. There were... You know, can can the researchers deliver product mm -hmm. in a timely manner that creates value? That's a that's a yeah. big thing. There's you know very few of these AI products that are getting paid for now. Yeah, especially by the enterprise. I mean, if you say AI is in maybe the second inning, maybe the third inning of your open AI, and you have a consumer product that people are using, enterprise AI is the game hasn't really even started yet. Yeah. There's proof of concepts out there. Obviously, every board of directors of every company in the last year has said, I need, what's our AI strategy? But they're starting to do proofs of concepts. They're starting to do research. They're starting to buy you know, the Gartner, research, Gartner reports of yeah. who should I be talking to? And there's been a lot of uh, tire kicking. And I think we're just starting to see, because you got to remember also, Last year's enterprise cycle was way down because yep. you're, you're dealing with the effects of all the market volatility. So budgets were cut in, in, 22, in 23, and therefore budgets were down and people were trying to look at proof of concepts. Now, as the market reemerges, budgets are up and the top of that budget prioritization is AI. Yep. So you're, you're going to start to see spend occur, 
But pretty soon after you're spending that money, you're going to want to see milestones. You're going to want to see proof of performance. You're going to want to see real value being created. And that's what everyone's going to be looking for in the second half of 24 and into 25. Well, it's funny, you know, talking to Florian from .IQ, again, with Matt Turk um, a few weeks ago, I, I actually think that opportunity is so much more interesting than consumer AI, yes. you know, in the enterprise, because I just think about it right now, you know, you know, you know, consumers have been very used to just going to Google and yes. searching for free and having to look at ads and this and that or whatever. I just think that enterprise, this is mission critical for them to do this. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think they're more likely to spend on some of this stuff um, than consumers are. Um, all right, Rick, we covered a lot of ground here. Um, I just really wanted to get a little vibe check of the sure. IPO market, evaluations in the private markets, how some of it might be spilling over into the public markets and some of these People themes. are feeling better. Yeah. People are feeling better than they have in the last couple of years. And you're starting to see some of the beginning beginning points, which leads you out of it. So last cycle's IPOs are, are, are starting to trade up and perform better. Obviously, NASDAQ at record highs, market at record highs. New issues are trading up almost irrationally. Yeah. And therefore, obviously showing fundamental demand. And we're seeing in the private markets, even companies that don't have the AI pixie dust are seeing great valuations if they're the premium companies. Yeah. All right. All good signs. All good signs. Um, it could be a sign of the top. I'm just saying, people, I'm not trying to push back by any means here. Um, all right. Stick around for my conversation with Rick and Joanna McFarland, the CEO of Hop Skip Drive. <laughs> 